Uh, one of those workshops, in fact, is from uh, the person who is our final keynote today, uh, Ed Rodley. He is the headliner of the conference, or the Edliner, if you will. Ed, don't groan, there's a worse one coming. Ed is an award-winning experience designer and a co-founder and principal at the Experience Alchemists, an experience design firm serving the cultural sector and beyond. He is a lifelong museum lover with over 25 years experience in envisioning, creating, and implementing visitor-focused projects for cultural organizations, large and small. Before starting the Experience Alchemists, Ed was Associate Director of Integrated Media at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. Incorporating emerging digital technologies into museum practice has been a theme throughout his career. As a thought leader in the digital transformation of the cultural sector, Ed was named one of Blue Loop's 50 Museum Influencers for 2021. He teaches museum experience design at the Harvard Extension School, blogs about museums at Thinking About Museums, and his book, Designing for Playful Engagement in Museums, is soon to be published by Routledge, or Routled, if you will. I promise to. Uh, please welcome to the stage, Ed Rodley. Thank you, Jim. Okay, I guess we're doing this. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I can barely see you. All right, so kia ora kutu. My name's Ed. Uh, I have the honor of being your final speaker at this amazing gathering, and uh, I'd like to take a moment before doing anything else to thank everyone at NDF uh, for inviting me to join you. So Lucy, Adam, Tana, Frith, Courtney, all the rest of the NDF folk, thank you very much for letting me be here. Um, I want to talk about evolution today and what it means for our sector and for our work. And there's going to be some audience participation as well, so I hope you have a little bit of energy left. Uh, fellow NDF first-timers, how you doing? Everybody hanging in there? <laughs> this, this stuff is intense. Uh, the first conference I went to as a, a lone person without other folks from my institution there was a Museums and the Web conference, and the first person I met was another first-timer. Uh, a guy from Austria named Otto. And I saw him the very first day of the conference, and then I didn't see him again for another three days. And at the last day of the conference, I passed him in the hallway, and he looked like hell. <laughs> and I said, Otto, how's it going? And he just sort of looked at me with dead eyes and said, I'm soaked in this conference. <laughs> I, I, I must go home. <laughs> and then he walked away, and I, I know exactly how he feels, right? After a couple of days of this, he's just like, Okay, so anyway, uh, I thought I would start a little bit by talking about uh, where I come from so you can kind of understand what my perspective is. Uh, I live in a small city called Cambridge, uh, so we're way down here and I'm way up there in northeastern North America. Um, our mountain is called Massachusetts, the Great Blue Hill. Our water is the Quinnebequin, the long still water. Uh, we're probably best known for a couple of schools you may have heard of called Harvard and MIT. Uh, it's also where Matt Damon and Ben Affleck grew up. Um, it is also the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag people who called the place on Macaugan uh, before the English came along in their inimitable fashion and renamed everything. Um, we've heard a lot about the struggles that people are going through doing this work, and one of the things I want to make clear to you all in your New Zealand context is that I envy you, uh, the struggles you're undertaking here for all of the heartache and the hardness, um, because in my country we struggle to even name these issues, and uh, let alone engage with them or try to repair them, and evolution is never easy, but it's certainly, it's a lot harder if you never start. Uh, so, you know, you have started, so carry on. Um, I've spent most of my life and all of my adult life working in museums, uh, which have their own remarkable set of problems that they have to deal with, and problematic genealogies of colonialism and imperialism and all the other stuff. Um, and like the rest of the cultural sector, they were already grappling with all of this. Like, does anyone remember what 2019 was when we were in 2019? <laughs> right? Worst year ever. Unionization efforts, people struggling with endemic low pay and exploitation, uh, museums being caught doing bad things, that was the year that the International Council of Museums couldn't even agree on a definition of the word museum, like they tried and failed. <laughs> and then the pandemic came along on top of that. Um, so 
you know, the field was and, and remains a hot mess, um, seemingly stuck between knowing that we have to do something and not being able to do much, because evolution is hard. Um, and I've spent a lot of my time working in museums uh, in the digital realm, which also contain their own legacies of colonization and domination embedded in the technologies, the structures, even the ways of thinking uh, that I've taken for granted for a very long time. Um, the tools that we rely on aren't available for lots and lots and lots of people and disproportionately indigenous communities. The technologies we employ to do our work Right? They have tremendous environmental impacts uh, that also disproportionately affect the people least able to mount an effective resistance against it, unless they get really creative, like Simon Coffey talked to us about the other day. Um, so the digital realm is not immune to the ills that plague us, which is a thing I used to think uh, when I first started doing digital work. I was like, ah, it's a new world. Everything is fresh and shiny here, and you can kind of escape from all of the mess that's going on in the real world. Uh, but as we have learned, like, no, it's, that's, everything that happens in the physical world has some outcome in the digital world, uh, and evolution is gonna be hybrid, right? Data is land. Uh, in my current role, I work with a wide range of organizations in the nonprofit sector, and regardless of whatever the ostensible scope of work I've been hired to do is, whether it's an exhibition or an installation or a digital strategy or a strategic plan, um, inevitably in all of those jobs, the need for decolonization, reconciliation, and allyship always rear their heads. Um, I've never been hired to work with anybody explicitly on that, and I've never not worked with somebody on that. So. Uh, I'm really interested in evolution and how it does or doesn't happen. Uh, and oftentimes it doesn't happen for a variety of reasons. And I'm at the particular point in my career now where I can see that like, time is growing short uh, and the amount of work to be done is a lot. Uh, so as we wind up the sessions here at NDF 23, I wanna talk about museums in the cultural sector, how they might evolve in this current digital age and how our primary product, right, the experiences we design, uh, can and should evolve. So I'll run you a little bit through my own personal evolution. Uh, I started working in museums in the 1970s as an extremely junior, junior volunteer who was about 12 at the time. Um, and I fell hard for the Museum of Science in Boston. Um, being a kid who could walk into that cavernous lobby and because I had a little paper badge that said junior volunteer, I could walk right by the guard uh, because I work here. It was probably the first time in my life I ever felt a sense of agency as a being. Uh, was because of that museum, and I, that feeling has never left me. Um, all throughout high school and college, I had pretty much every shitty front of house job one could hope to have. I was an elevator operator, I was a guard, I was a ticket taker, I was a garage attendant. Uh, I bagged shark's teeth in the store in groups of three and stapled them together and sold them to kids for 25 cents. Um, and I developed, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of feelings about the institution. Right, I was exciting to be part of a big machine, especially when you're a little kid. Um, and the sense of freedom that a couple of staff keys could give you, of being able to go through a door that other people can't go through, <sighs> very exciting. Uh, I also uh, developed that sense of grievance that the underpaid and underappreciated have for their higher ups and for the organization. Uh, like, you know, I learned how to skillfully loaf, uh, how to cut lunch breaks a little bit long, come in a little bit late, leave a little bit early, all of the things that uh, you wind up learning in the workplace. And my world was that building. Fast forward to uh, after college, and I fell into what I would call, I guess, professional museum work, uh, almost by accident, truth be told. I started working in an exhibitions department as, I think my first title was uh, staff assistant. What were my responsibilities? Whatever my boss told me. Uh, I unloaded trucks, I applied carpet adhesive to interactive components, uh, I traveled around installing and dismantling traveling exhibitions that we had, and um, eventually ascended to what I thought were the exalted ranks of the people who developed content for exhibitions. Like I got to be the guy who helped figure out what was the thing that was gonna go on display. And I thought, I have, I have arrived. This is the thing that is the thing I wanna do. And um, I actually got to go to conferences. That's one of the lucky few, right? And suddenly realized like, oh, there are other science museums in the world and they have their own weird problems that are different than my problems, but there are some interesting similarities. And my world grew to be a little bit bigger of a group of science museums. And it was during this time that um, I first 
watched a bunch of colleagues in IT um, demoing a thing called Mosaic, which was a web browser, uh, which is a thing that you could just type in stuff and you could somehow connect with information all over the planet. <laughs> Uh, even if it was as dumb as like watching a coffee pot in a British university to see whether or not there was any coffee left in it, the idea that you could suddenly connect to knowledge all over the world from anywhere you were as long as you had a computer that was hooked up to this thing um, was you know, nothing short of magical. Uh, I felt like I became a citizen of a much larger world. When I left science museums and started working in art museums, um, I got the chance to see how the other half lived and more opportunities, and more importantly, um, that community of practice that flourished at places like museums in the web, uh, the Museum Computer Network Conference in the US, and I watched a lot of MDF talks, talks from afar, um, and my world became that sort of global community of like-minded enthusiasts and dreamers and progressives. And then the pandemic ended all of that. Um, anyone have a good 2020? <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. Uh, in the space of a month, my mother died, I lost my job uh, as part of that big second wave of layoffs that happened in the US. And needing to do something productive and figuring the chances of finding a museum job in the middle of a global pandemic were probably kind of small. Um, I started a small company with a couple of friends of mine. And we were, from the outset, trying to embody all of our unfulfilled aspirations for what doing creative work in the cultural sector could be like. So how do you build something that is able to do the things that you like and doesn't automatically just carry along all the baggage that comes along with the way that work happens? Um, and nowadays, my world is even bigger. Uh, it's much more diverse. And it is not only the clients that I work with who are all people who, in their own ways trying to evolve. Uh, it's also a community of creative people who are all trying to figure out ways to do more impactful work. So like all of the talks over the last two days have just been going like right into my head. Okay. Um, if I had to sum up the whole thing though, I owe my whole career to being somebody who played around in the digital realm. Uh, and it feels a little silly to say that, but um, really I'm here because of two pieces of software, right? Twitter and WordPress. Um, if it weren't for those things, I don't know where I'd be, but I wouldn't be here right now. And one of the reasons I feel so particularly um, strident about this need to evolve is that when I look at my own career path and I look at the career paths of my younger colleagues, uh, particularly ones who've been working of like the last 15 years, like if your whole professional life happens between the financial crisis of 2009 and now, uh, their opportunity space is very different than the opportunity space that I had coming up in the profession. And I have a, I have a graphic to show you. So um, LinkedIn used to have this really cool tool called InMaps that would let you visualize your professional network. It was so great that they took it down for no reason and never put it back. Um, <laughs> but this is a visualization of my professional network circa like 2013. And on uh, your right-hand side is 25 years of me working in science museums. So all of that blue stuff, a pretty dense cluster of people who are fairly homogenous. They work in the same kinds of institutions, they have the same kind of jobs. Uh, and then on the other side is three years of being on Twitter and actively blogging. And that network is much more diverse, it is much more global. Uh, the people who are in there do a very wide variety of things. And when I look around today, particularly in the digital realm, like there's nothing like that uh, for people. Even if you wanted to, try to do that, where are you gonna go? Like all of the gardens have become walled gardens or they suck, like the thing that used to be Twitter. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, so what I'd like to do first um, is play a little game quickly, I hope you don't mind. Um, there are index cards and hopefully there are people around with pencils. Oh, does everybody have index cards already? Yay, okay. So. Um, this is gonna be a very simple game. I'm gonna ask you five questions, and I want you to answer them. Um, one of the things that uh, you can do with these after we're done with them, aside from just take them home, uh, if you're the kind of person who needs a conversational icebreaker, this is a great thing, you can ask somebody, so like, how, how do you answer those stupid questions that guy asked you at the end? Uh, if you're an introvert, and that is the worst thing imaginable, just fold it up and put it in your pocket, and you don't have to talk to any about it. Uh, that's fine. The important thing is I want you to only write answers that are true. 
okay? So the first question is a very straightforward question. What are you gonna bring home from NDF 23? It might be a learning, it might be someone's card, uh, it could just be a stack of receipts that you're gonna have to account for. Uh, whatever you decide to answer, that's fine. And we'll give you a little less than a minute to answer it. I'll do it too. Um, do you have a pencil? Thank you, Jim. Okay. Ready for question two? I see some nods. Okay, great. Question two is, what are you going to bring home from this event? Can't be the same answer as the first one. You probably had like at least two things in your brain when you were thinking, which one are you going to pick? All right, so now pick another one. All right, anybody want to take a guess at what question three is? <laughs> what are you going to bring home from this event? Is it getting a little harder? No? Okay. Don't care what the answer is, just make sure that it's true. All right, fourth question. <laughs> what are you gonna bring home from this event? Getting any harder to find four things? Everybody seems to be pretty on task. All right, we're gonna save the fifth one, the mysterious fifth question for later in the presentation. So hang on to your, your paper. Um, so let's talk about evolution. Like why is evolution necessary? The reason the field needs to evolve is because so much has changed, right? If you think, I, I talk about pre uh, pre-pandemic as the before times now, like capital B, capital T, because if the pandemic has proved nothing else, it's proved how brittle a lot of our systems were and the things that we took for granted as being sort of immutable bedrock stuff is really yeah, not so much. Um, one of my favorite um, people talking about the pandemic was the Indian author Arundhati Roy. Uh, if you have not come across her paper, uh, the pandemic is a portal, which strangely enough appeared in the Financial Times. Uh, it is totally worth reading. Um, she wrote this piece in, I think, April of 2020, so right at the height of the first peak of the pandemic when the death toll in India and elsewhere was catastrophic. Uh, and the outcome was completely uncertain, right? April 2020, nobody knew what was gonna happen. Uh, and somehow in the midst of all of this, she was able to see what was going on as an opportunity. Uh, and the whole piece is brilliant, but this quote tends to be the one that gets the most exposure, possibly because it's just so beautifully written. But uh, she says, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudices and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And reading this in mid-2020 was like, wow. But even more than that, uh, the sentence right before that was, nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Like one of the things I was certain of in 2020 and 2021 was this was gonna be the thing that was gonna get the sector off its ass uh, to start doing things differently. I figured there'd be a break, it would probably even thirds. A third would go back to life as normal, a third would probably collapse, and a third would find some new way forward. And um, I'm a little disappointed, I gotta say. 
there's a lot more returning to normality than I wish would, uh, would have happened, but you know, here we are. So what does evolution require of us? Um, one of the reasons I call myself uh, an experienced designer nowadays rather than any of the other titles that I've worn over the last 35 years um, is that I've always been bad at coloring uh, inside the lines or staying in my lane or doing any of the other things uh, that people expect you to do in a job. And one of the main tenets of experienced design, the way I think about it, is that everything is a designable surface. Right? We choose to design things or we choose not to design things, but everything is amenable to design. Meetings, organizations, workflows, products, relationships. Um, and the potential breadth of possibility for what you can do is it's terrifying because it's literally everything. Uh, and the extent to which um, we rely on things that we did not design, that other people before us have designed that we just sort of do. Right? Why are meetings an hour? I don't know. Um, what are some other examples? Well, just think of your everyday life at work, the way, the way you go about things and the way that people just take for granted. Um, Twas ever thus. It, it wasn't, really. So uh, another great example of this would be uh, if you've ever had a colleague uh, listen to uh, an idea for doing something different and says, like, that's not the way we do things here. Right, that's, that's not the way. And if you're like me and you follow it up with like, oh yeah, why? Uh, you have sometimes awkward conversations with colleagues, but um, it's important to ask these things because doing the same old, same old is a design choice. So carrying on with the status quo is really saying like, yeah, this works well enough for us and we're not gonna worry about it because we've got other things to worry about. Uh, the pandemic, if nothing else, has pointed out how much of our sector needs our attention and all of our creativity. Right? We either design our future or we be relegated to living out somebody else's design for the future. Uh, and this is something that Karl Marx understood 150 years ago. Background in social studies, uh, social sciences, everything eventually leads back to Marx. Uh, and this idea of his that uh, we make our own history but we don't do it as we please. Right? They do not make it under self-selected circumstances but under circumstances existing already given and transmitted from the past. In other words, we don't get to play the hand we want, you get to play the hand you're dealt. Um, for those of you who are into gambling, right? We do not have complete freedom. Uh, there are a bunch of circumstances that are just here and it's our job to deal with them. So, an interesting thought experiment. Uh, if you were tasked to build a brand new organization from the ground up with the same mission statement as your current organization, what would it look like? Would it look like the place you work? Would it employ the same people? Uh, would it have the same audience? I'm gonna guess unless your organization is quite new, the answer is probably no. Uh, and that's worth thinking about, like why? Why is that? One of the reasons is that cultural organizations are great at additive change, but they suck at subtractive change. Uh, right, I could, I could show you the, the, all of the major milestones of my career uh, of various directors and bosses handing me things saying, I know this seems like a bad idea, but here's a project or a strategic initiative or some new imperative. Uh, and this idea that change is just adding stuff uh, is something that is obviously not tenable. Uh, if I had a nickel for every time somebody dropped a new project in my lap uh, and didn't take anything else out, I'd have, I'd have a lot of nickels, uh, which doesn't mean much anymore. I guess I'll find a new way to describe that. Anyway, uh, back in 2018, I had a conversation with a guy named Jay Rounds, uh, who's a museum theorist who's been looking at organizational change in museums for 30 or 40 years now, um, and specifically looking at paradigm shifts in the sector. And I asked Jay to... Uh, give me his explanation for what he thought was wrong with the sector. Uh, and his, his immediate answer was surfeit of values, with one of those deep Midwestern US voices that just kind of rolls over you. I was like, a surfeit of virtues? Like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, and this was his answer. Uh, and we were talking specifically about exhibits, but you could call this museums or cultural organizations or what have you. But the idea is that there are so many demands for what we ought to be. Uh, or how we should be made that they can paralyze us, right? 
Many of these de demands seem virtuous in isolation, right? They're all good things we're trying to do. Uh, you know, we're not trying to get people to take up smoking or gambling or bad things. Uh, but a lot of these virtues, they are in conflict with each other. Uh, and we, it's impossible to do them all at once and end up with something that is worth doing. But since we seem to have lost the organizing principle for helping us prioritize, all right, among these 17 virtues, which one's, what's gonna be virtue one and what's gonna be virtue 17? Um, and the thing that really got me was the end of this thing, right? We've become so dedicated to being virtuous that we forget how to be good. And our products and processes kind of reflect that. So Jay likes to talk about the, para <laughs> the paradigm onion. So if you imagine a cross-section of an onion, uh, and then think about uh, the organization of an institution, there's usually some kind of core ideology, right? There's a mission statement, a problem you're trying to solve, uh, and then over time, uh, solutions get applied to that. Uh, and these are all design choices. If this is the problem we're trying to solve, here's a way we might solve it. And layer after layer of solution get applied to that, and eventually you wind up with a thing called a body of practice. Click, hello, there we go. Uh, right, and so when you start working in an organization, this is the thing you learn. This is, the, this is how we do things here. Uh, but what you usually don't learn is what is the history of those decisions because they are all things that were made in very specific moments in time uh, and they have uh, circumstances that they were responding to that probably don't exist anymore. So, um, according to Jay, uh, what happens over time is the more and more layers you get in this onion, the less and less they become about solving the core ideology and the more they become about efficiency. How do we do what we have always done a little bit better, a little faster, a little cheaper, what have you? And eventually, um, if you grow up in this kind of paradigm, like I did, uh, it was kind of cool. Everybody did kind of the same thing. There was, you know, there was differences and in innovations among them, but largely the institutions all just kind of sailed along fairly stably. Uh, but when you start to question the entire thing, uh, not just the body of practice, but all the solutions and the core ideology, then you get to a paradigm crisis. And guess what? We're living through a paradigmatic crisis right now. Congratulations. Um, and what do we know about paradigmatic crises? Also, according to Jay, it kind of sucks to live through them. Right, this is, this is not fun by any stretch of the imagination. There are other things we could be doing with our time. But the only way out of a paradigmatic crisis is through them. Um, and that's where I would argue we all find ourselves right now in late 2023, right? Smack in the middle of a mess with no clear path out of it. Uh, but the only way out is to decide to try to get out of it, right? To break with tradition uh, and decide to design ways of being in the world that are fit for the current moment and not for the last century, which a lot of them are. So what does the future hold for us? Um, since we are in Middle Earth, I will drop a Galadriel quote on you. I do not foretell, for all foretelling is in vain. On the one hand lies darkness, on the other only hope. Uh, I do not foretell either. I have no special intelligence on what's gonna happen, but I can say this. Um, what I often see in my current role as a consultant is that even the ones willing to, um, that even the willing ones fail to understand how institutional change or evolution works. Uh, so with apologies to any evolutionary biologists out in the audience, I'm going to do some violence to the concept of evolution in the name of metaphor. Uh, thank you, Pulwai. Um, I'd like to offer up a couple of observations on evolution. Right? Uh, one thing we know about evolution is that it is messy, painful, and extremely wasteful of resources, which are things that organizations hate. Uh, it is virtually impossible to design a foolproof process to figure out a way out of the current mess. And if I were a betting man, uh, I'd wager that it's completely impossible to design a process that doesn't involve substantial discomfort for everybody in that organization trying to evolve. Uh, it is hard. It involves having all kinds of ugly meetings, um, emails that you don't want to read or write. You name it. They'll be flailing around, disagreements about which paths to pursue, and how much will need to be spent working to, on this to figure it out. And all of this is absolutely necessary, right? There is no way forward that does not involve uh, that pain. <sighs> Sorry. Probably even worse than that, um, the other thing we know from evolution is that most experiments will fail, and most adaptations will be bad ones. 
Um, so paradigmatic crises breed lots and lots and lots and lots of potential solutions, and out of that mess, uh, one of them or several of them will arise as things that are viable, but that means the other 97 of them probably not gonna be viable. Uh, and this is probably the thing that gives executive directors the heebie-jeebies more than anything, even the money. Uh, the idea that you could do everything right, you could design like a great process and try to do exactly the right thing and it still might tank. Um, but that is the way of things. And as a sector, we're not particularly, uh, agile is not the right word. Uh, Elaine Gurian talks about uh, wanting to be third on your block, which is a great way to describe how museums tend to operate. Um, there are very few that want to be the first one to try something new, because what if it's wrong? Uh, and even if you're the second one, could be a fluke. Uh, if you're the third one, uh, then chances are most of the bad things have been ironed out and it's safe. Uh, where that kind of falls apart, though, is, is if nobody's willing to be first, then nobody's gonna be third. Uh, I, I liken it to like a bunch of teenagers standing on a railroad bridge over the river, getting ready to jump in, right? Everybody wants to, they're all dying to, but nobody's gonna go first, and they all just stand there, looking down at the water, thinking like, wow, it's a long way down. Like, why did I come up here? Uh, and we are, that's where we are, right? We need to start jumping. Um, so I'm, I'm not counseling prudence, even though I've given you a couple of really doomy slides here. Um, the right thing to do is not try to wait it out. I have this conversation with executives often. Um, you know, we're, we're, our organization is doing okay, relatively speaking. We can just keep doing what we're doing. Uh, and you know, in the next five years, the situation will sort itself out and we'll be okay. Uh, and I don't think that is gonna be the case for the vast majority of our institutions. And um, the reason I think that's a bad idea is because the question that we need to be answering uh, particularly in this moment in history, is one that's all about evolution. And that question is, how will you be a good ancestor? Um, Richard Josie asks this question of all of his clients. He does a lot of work around uh, reconciliation and social justice work. And what I like about the question, how will you be a good ancestor, uh, is that it gets us all to think about, it's not just what we're doing right now and making our own lives a little less maddening and crazy, but what are we setting up now that is gonna make life better for the people who come after us? And that, that is both an individual and a collective burden uh, that we need to be picking up and carrying. Uh, you know, I, do you want to be the kind of person that your successors 30 years from now are gonna look back through the files and go, wow, thank God so-and-so had the guts to try, fill in the blank. Uh, or do you wanna be one of those people that they look back on and go like, hmm. yeah, okay, not so much. So to bring it back to Arundhati Roy and her choice, right? Uh, to me, being a good ancestor in these times, almost but not quite post-pandemic, if we're ever gonna be post-pandemic, pre-whatever we decide to call the next thing, um, being a good ancestor means really answering two questions. Right? What are you willing to try, knowing that the chances of success are small, and what are you willing to stop doing? to make space for those possibilities. <laughs> See a little nodding, okay. Um, so, this is the end of the doomy part of the talk in case people are like, oh my God, just shoot me. <laughs> so who's out there doing interesting stuff? Because people are out there trying things, right? We are, we are all looking for examples of people who are in exactly the same boat we're in, in slightly different circumstances. Um, and I was having a conversation with, uh, with Paula Bray a couple of weeks ago, and she was asking me, like, well, what big organizations do you know that are actually making some progress? And I had nothing to say to her at the time, which I think made her a little sad. Uh, but I've been thinking about it a lot since then, so I actually do have some examples that I'd like to share with you, uh, with the caveat that a lot of these are new. Some of them are probably gonna fail, uh, but people are out there all over the planet trying things. So. Um, the kinds of things that people are trying to solve that I think are interesting uh, are really being sort of laser focused on problems that matter to local communities. So there are two places uh, in India, the Museum of Solutions in Mumbai, which is now led by our India friend Mike Edson, uh, and the Science Gallery in Bengaluru that are both tackling what it means to be valuable to their communities in ways that I have not seen before. 
Uh, so the Museum of Solutions aims to inspire, enable, and empower children to bring meaningful change. So the whole mission of the institution is to teach the children of Mumbai how to be the solvers of the problems of today and tomorrow that their grown-ups have not figured out how to deal with yet. Uh, and this idea of inculcating in the next generation the idea that this is a thing that you can do. Uh, despite the fact that a lot of our problems are gigantic problems, uh, this, this notion that it is something that is doable, problems can be solved, is something that I think is really interesting. Um, in the case of Science Gallery, um, they have a very clear mandate. So Science Gallery, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a model that started in Dublin by a guy named Michael John Gorman, and they have basically franchised all over the world, and they are very much looking at ways to redefine public engagement around science. How can you make science uh, more interesting and relevant to people? And in the case of Science Gallery Bengaluru, um, they had the situation of looking at the things that they had been told are part of the Science Gallery playbook, uh, and realizing that they couldn't just copy the model that they had been given because Ireland is not India. Uh, and so, um, you know, yesterday Simon Coffey talked about needing to understand the spirit that underlies practice, right? And so what they wound up doing in their case was figuring out what was the spirit of Science Gallery uh, and how can we be true to that, which basically meant throwing out most of the playbook for how Science Galleries operate all over the world. Um, and it will be very interesting to see how successful they are in trying to apply that. But this idea that um, solutions really need to be tailored to your local community if you expect to have any chance of success, I think is worthwhile. There are also lots of organizations that are really looking at what it means to be truly local and not just located uh, in a community. Right? I spent most of my career working for large museums that were physically located in places that they had kind of tenuous relationships with. Uh, and people, we would talk about the local community and why doesn't the local community come in? And you can spend pretty much years of your life doing that, not very productively. Um, so two of the organizations that I want to talk about here are, this is a mouthful of a name, but anyway, the Ellen DeGeneres campus of the Diane Fossey Guerrilla Fund in Rwanda. <laughs> uh, and not surprisingly to many of you probably, the Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania. So in the case of the Fossey Center, um, what they wanted to try to do was figure out a way to build this gigantic campus in rural Rwanda in a way that actually worked for the local uh, economy and the people who were there, who were going to be impacted by this gigantic thing landing in their backyard. Um, so the emphasis on things like passive systems and figuring out what are the local natural building materials and who are the craftspeople who live in the neighborhood who can be employed to build this thing rather than just dragging in the trailers and the workers from somewhere else to make this thing, uh, actually wound up creating an entire local community that hadn't existed before, a local economy that hadn't existed before because they needed so much stuff made. Um, the local uh, volcanic rock that before then was just the sort of thing that farmers would throw out of their fields, uh, they figured out a way to turn it into useful building stone and trained up an entire cadre of stonemasons who now get hired by like millionaires in Kigali to do their houses because these things look so marvelous. Um, and the furniture inside the buildings has all been made by local people and the local, uh, the materials have been sourced locally. Like it, it is important to the people in that community in a way that a lot of museums aren't because they can see literally their community reflected in the buildings, not just the mission of the place. Okay. Mona, according to Mona, Arts and exhibitions and stuff, but also live music, food, wine, bars, restaurants, cellar door accommodation, library, recording studio, and a tennis court, and probably something new by now. I just haven't looked recently. Um, you know, who, who went to Tasmania before Mona opened? Anyone? OK, one, there we go. We got some. OK, how many have been to Tasmania since Mona opened? Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you want sort of a gold class example of how a museum can actually completely revolutionize a uh, community. Like, here's, here's your example. Um, and the fact that it is a museum that is largely contemporary art, not necessarily noted for being like a huge draw, um, particularly, uh, well, yeah, we won't even get at that. So say what you will about David Walsh. The entire island of Tasmania knows who he is, knows his institution, and has some personal connection to that institution uh, in ways that are very direct and very tangible. And then the last group 
um, that I've been seeing are people who are interested in telling complicated truths, right? There's a lot of truth telling that needs to happen these days uh, that has not been done traditionally. And two examples in the US are the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery and the First Americans Museum in Oklahoma. So uh, the memorial in Alabama, the visitor experience of it is you walk through this gigantic concourse and dangling over your head are these gigantic um, steel monoliths that seem like they're gonna fall down on you at any moment. And when you look up, on the bottom of each monolith is a county in the United States and engraved in each one of those monoliths are the names of every known person who was lynched in the country. And you get a very different sense of US history walking through this place than you would get in a more didactic, traditional setting. Uh, and they tell you right up front that their goal is to get rid of all of these things. They want every single co county in the country that has one of these monoliths to come and claim it and put it somewhere where it belongs. Uh, thus far, not many people have taken them up on it, but again, um, that's a hard truth to tell and it's done in a very compelling way. First Americans Museum uh, is one of the first native-funded, uh, native native-led, native-operated museums in the country that tells more than just a story of a particular tribe. Uh, so in the case of um, First Americans, uh, they are located in Oklahoma, which used to be known as Indian Territory. So for those of you who don't know your 19th century US history, this was the place that you got deported to when you got kicked out of your ancestral homelands. Um, so of the 39 tribes that currently live in, uh, in Oklahoma, only three of them lived in Oklahoma uh, in, the, in the 18th century. The rest of them have all been basically forced out of their homes from, as you can see, all over the friggin' continent, uh, including like, you know, the poor Modoc, all the way from Northern California down to Southern Oklahoma. And the story you learn about the history of the United States in this place is very different than the history you will learn of the United States anywhere else. Okay, and that's just some of the things that are happening in museums, right? This is a very small part of a much larger landscape of people talking about making visitor experiences. Um, you know, this doesn't include things like Meow Wolf. Uh, we'll talk about Immersive Inco in a second. Uh, and all of those other things that are happening out there. The world is much bigger than our sector, right? If nothing else, go look outside of what museums are doing if you wanna see what is possible. So, what are some of the most interesting evolutions in experience design today? Um, I am going to make the argument that there are sort of four concepts that keep coming up over and over again in interesting visitor experiences that have happened over the last few years. People have been very focused on sensory immersion, uh, right, so immersive Van Gogh, but not just immersive Van Gogh. And I will say right here that I'm not here to rain on immersive Van Gogh because millions and millions of people have found that to be a compelling experience. And you may disagree with them, but be that as it may. Um, emotional evocation, like experiences specifically designed to acknowledge the fact that we're emotional beings and that's okay. Um, storytelling, narrative transportation, um, actually really spending a lot of time thinking on what does a story need to have in order to be satisfying. And lastly, uh, what the academics call ludic participation or gameful participation, right? So how do you design things that are play experiences as a way of helping people understand the world? And the interesting thing about these things is they hardly ever occur alone. They usually occur in multiples, right? So immersive experiences tend to talk a lot about storytelling uh, or emotional uh, experiences have a play element and a storytelling element. And you'll find these things wrapped up around each other all the time, which makes it kind of hard to tease them apart, but we're gonna try. All right, immersion seems to be having quite a moment over the last few years, right? Uh, all from Lighthouse Interactive's uh, Immersive Van Gogh back in 2018 uh, to more, what I would consider more interesting, more fully developed immersive environments like Team Lab uh, in Japan or Marshmallow Laser Feast in the UK. Um, Immersive's almost gotten to the point where it's sort of not worth mentioning as a term anymore. Like, what does immersive mean, uh, right? We are, we are always immersed in wherever we are all the time. You are immersed in this space. I am immersed in this space. When we go outside, we'll be immersed in the outdoors. Uh, apparently, Disney uh, Imagineering does not allow their staff to use the word immersive in pitch documents anymore because it basically just takes up space. So, um, for those of you who are thinking, you know, Immersion might be over, like 
Uh, White House went bankrupt, even though they sold millions and millions of tickets to immersive Van Gogh. Uh, ooh, connect to the internet. I don't want to connect to the internet. Uh, I'm, I'm here to rain on your parade a little bit. Have any of you seen the Sphere in Las Vegas? Um, this was a recently built immersive uh, venue. It's a performing arts venue, well, performance venue. Um, what you're looking at is a 538,000 square foot LED display. So that thing is a moving, spinning Earth. Sometimes it's the moon, sometimes it's a giant eyeball. Uh, you can see that from space. And that's just the exterior. The interior is also a gigantic uh, LED display space. So this is a U2 concert. Uh, those tiny little things down on the bottom, there are the boys on stage. Uh, there's the audience down around them. And everything else in that picture is digital video. Uh, it is an absolutely astonishing technical accomplishment. Uh, here's a cutaway just to give you an idea. What? $2.3 billion US to make this thing. So clearly people still think uh, immersion is a thing that is worth pursuing. Um, the thing I want to talk about, though, is that uh, like with a lot of these technologies, they tend to get dehistoricized. Like, this is totally new. Nothing like this has ever happened. Uh, it breaks all of the rules. And that's really not the case. Um, so here is a late 18th century immersive experience called Phantasmagoria. Uh, done by a French guy named Etienne Gaspard Robert, who went by the stage name of Robertson, uh, because gothic horror was all about being English. Uh, and this thing employed uh, live actors, smoke effects, music, magic lanterns projecting images onto smoke. Uh, what else was in there? Oh, it takes place inside a ruined convent. Uh, so the whole environment is super creepy. And uh, this thing absolutely wowed audiences for like 10 years. And if you look at the date, 1798, like all of these adults have lived through the French Revolution and the terror. So people who grew up with you know, guillotines in the public squares, uh, not the faint of heart folks, and this thing absolutely freaked people out. You can see guys you know, reaching for their swords to try to defend themselves from death that is coming to get them. Um, here's a beautiful building that was built by Anton von Werner in Berlin. Uh, this gigantic structure was built to house an immersive. Uh, it was a 360-degree panorama called the Battle of Sedan. So it's, it's like the great-grandfather of the sphere. Uh, and the whole point of this thing was to basically give Germans a sense of how glorious it was to be German because uh, they beat the crap out of the French, and the Second Reich was going to be the thing forever. If you're interested, there is still one of these things around. Uh, the next time you're in the Netherlands, uh, if you want to go to Den Haag, there's a thing called the Panorama Mezdag that was done in 1881. Uh, so what you can see is there's a 360-degree painting of just an ordinary day in Scheveningen. Uh, you've got a diorama surrounding it, so it's this blend of real and virtual. Um, you come up from below through a staircase into a thing that looks like a beach pavilion, and you can see that they've designed it in such a way that you can't actually see any of the seams, so it is a completely all-encompassing immersive experience. I don't want to connect to the internet. Just stop. Sorry. Um, so what is it about sensory immersion, right? Why do we care so much about immersion? And I would say that we care about immersion because it triggers a shift in how we attend to our environment, which makes us more likely to remember it. Right? So if you think about diving into a pool, right, the moment you jump into a pool, your entire body says, like, whoa, what's going on? Um, and your brain switches from the default mode that we tend to spend our lives in uh, into trying to understand everything that's going on so that you can make sense of it. And the, the upside of that is that your brain processes everything much more thoroughly than it generally does. However, this is only a temporary thing, right? If you keep being in the water, uh, the immersion effect wears off and you start trying to not drown or you tread water or you do laps or whatever. Uh, and, and for me, probably the biggest complaint I have with immersive Van Gogh and its ilk is that once the immersion effect wears off, if there's not something else there, then you think, I'm getting out of the pool. Um, and if you look at like TripAdvisor data on these immersive experiences, you'll see there are lots of people who say, oh, it's great for like 15 or 20 minutes, and then I got bored. Um, so the other interesting thing about immersion is that 
it requires us to design not only for the center of attention, the thing you're looking at, but immersion only works because it encompasses everything, which is really, there is a whole tradition of exhibition design practice that is focused on absolutely not that. Right, everything is about the object in the case, uh, and whatever comes around it, you just paint it white or gray and hope that it goes away. Uh, it's, it's a real, uh, it's what we would call an anti-pattern in design. Okay, so immersion as a beginning, not an end. This is a quote from a, a game scholar named Mark Wolf. Um, what he argues, and he's talking more about uh, massively multiplayer online games and museum exhibitions, is that immersion is really only the first step of an experience. And an audience may be immersed in an imaginary world, but unless it is built with care and has something else there, uh, the desire to stay there is gonna dry up pretty quickly. So, he proposes a four-stage model of immersive engagement, that he calls it, of which the first stage is the immersion, right? You have to be in this environment that you recognize as new and interesting and you want to explore it. Um, that can be followed by absorption, right? So as you explore this world, uh, you start learning the rules. If you've ever watched somebody play a video game for the first time, like, can I pick this up? What happens when I do that? Oh, okay, if I do this, something happens. Uh, or in the case of Immersive Van Gogh, you know, you see people touching the walls, like is anything gonna happen if I, if I touch the image? Nope, okay, go into the next room, do that again. <laughs> so absorption can lead to saturation, right? That feeling that you've been exploring this thing and you've taken in everything you can. Um, and then finally, the fourth stage of this he calls overflow. He's really going with the water metaphor here. Uh, this idea, which he thinks is a very satisfying realization, which I, I think I agree with, uh, is that oftentimes you can be in experiences where you feel like, okay, I, I just can't do it all. There is just too much here for me to do. Uh, think about open world uh, computer games where you can go back a zillion times and do something different every time and run into something new every time. Uh, the, these imaginary environments can just be too big. Right, and this is the potential uh, for immersive experiences. It still wants me to connect the internet. Okay, moving right along. Um, let's talk about emotional evocation for a second. John Falk has done a lot of work on visitor motivation in museums, uh, and one of the things that has come out of some of his research is this idea that this is supported by a huge amount of psychological and neuroscience research as well, that every memory comes with an emotional stamp attached to it. And the stronger the emotional value, the more likely we are to remember that. Like, if you can remember the last time you were kind of bored, not really bored, because really bored is kind of an emotional state in and of itself, but just kind of like, eh. This is the, the equivalent of, uh, like when you ask somebody what did they have for breakfast yesterday. Uh, we don't remember things that don't have an emotional stamp attached to them. That's just the way our bodies are wired. And we don't often take this into consideration, um, where I would argue that a lot of the things we're trying to do is get people to think about things and remember things and then take those things back into their lives. So making things memorable should be a core part of what we're up to. Um, and we already know that people come to cultural organizations looking to have a satisfying emotional experience. Um, this is a survey that's been running in the U.S. since 2015, maybe, uh, called Culture Track. And these are uh, Americans' motivations for going to cultural events. And they define culture very broadly. High culture, museums, opera, performing arts, cinema, going to restaurants, hanging out with friends, going to the park, all of that counts as cultural participation. And what is the number one reason? Having fun. Um, Look at all of these things that have an emotional stamp. Feeling less stressed, feeling inspired, feeling transported, feeling welcome, gives life deeper meaning, um, bettering health and well-being. All of these things are people looking to have a satisfying emotional experience. Falk and Gillespie actually did a study um, where they did the thing that we hardly ever do, which was follow up with people longitudinally. So they looked at people who went to an exhibition uh, about fear. And then they went back and interviewed them three months and six months later to see how much of that experience did they remember. And the, the, against a control group who went to another exhibition about like airplanes or something uh, at the same museum. And the evidence was pretty conclusive that the the name of the exhibition was Goosebumps, so that particular exhibition stimulated a significantly higher level of reflection and follow-up learning than was the case for control visitors. And I could go on and on. Okay, 
the last couple I want to talk about. Narrative transportation, right? So storytelling. Uh, or we, we could get into the weeds about what is the difference between story and narrative. Um, unlike the other three techniques, this is the only one I think that most museums would already consider to be kind of at the heart of what they do, uh, right? Like if you do a Google search for museum tells the story of and just let it go, um, you'll come back with you know, a couple of million hits. Um, and this was, you know, this was literally like 15 seconds of me just Googling around. Um, yet at the same time, um, storytelling is not a thing that a lot of people get training around. Right? It's, it's both novel. Uh, ooh, we're going we're gonna to use a story-based um, method for trying to tell this. Uh, and it's also a thing that we always say we do. And the interesting thing about narrative transportation, um, evolutionarily speaking, is it's a thing that we have always done. Um, and there are plenty of scientists who will say that we are evolutionary, evolutionarily adapted to be storytellers. And the advantage that that gives us is that storytelling allows you to feel things that didn't happen to you. Right? So somebody in your band tells you about staying away from that big animal with the tusks. Uh, and they describe their encounter with that animal so that if you've never even seen that animal and later on you run into it, um, you already have in your brain that sense of like, oh, that's the, the thing with the big tusks. All right, I'm going to stay away from that. Um, and that resonates through everything that we do. Right? This idea this is why people love books. Right? A.S. Byatt just died. It was so sad. Um, this idea that Stories give you the ability to experience things that you haven't actually gone through, and they've done studies to show that your brains actually secrete the chemicals that happen when you are having those emotional responses yourself. Like, you feel the things that the characters feel in the stories. Um, and this is an incredibly important thing. Right? This is the way we explain the world, it's the way we predict the future, and it's not just a recitation of facts. Right? Like, if you ever asked a two-year-old or a three-year-old to tell you about, like, what was your day? I got up, mommy made me breakfast, I got dressed, we went to school. That's not a story. Um, stories have more than just recitation of facts. They're trying to make a point, uh, or they have a moral, right? This idea of you're trying to teach something. So learning to make your ideas into real narratives, they have to do more than just recite what has happened in the past. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, here's an exhibition that I worked on at, at PEM uh, around the reopening of their maritime gallery, and they have this 1840s French salon painting that people spend about three seconds looking at and go like, ugh, boats, and they move on. Um, and, but it tells a very interesting story about a, a, a terrifying encounter between French sailors and folks in the Torres Strait. Uh, so we actually built an enclosure for this thing and uh, went and found a Torres Strait Islander artist and a French marine painter uh, to talk about the story that they saw when they looked at these things. And we would routinely get people spending six or seven minutes in this space looking at this painting. There's also a little light show that goes with it that would highlight details as the artists are talking about what they're looking at when they see the painting. Uh, and so the potential for storytelling is just, it's, it's immense. Okay, we're running low on time. I want to talk a little bit about games. Thank you for the timer, by the way. OK, gameful participation. Before immersion came along, gamification, for those of you who were in the field long enough, had its own heyday for about a decade. We were going to gamify the crap out of everything. Um, and Sebastian Dieterding, who is uh, a game theorist, uh, who is also an experienced designer and does a lot of work around uh, like designing interesting meetings uh, for people, talks about um, gameful participation having really three main features. Like, good games do things. They have a meaning. Uh, to be effective, these applications need to connect to something that's already meaningful. Uh, so if you've ever tried to, or if you've ever been to a museum exhibit where they made a game out of something like, you know, how white blood cells kill bad things, uh, you're like, okay. If you don't have that connection to something that is already meaningful to you, it's very hard to get these things to be successful experiences. Um, the other thing that good game full experiences have is they have the ability for you to recognize your mastery, right? So if you've grown up in the video game era, like most of the time you watch people playing video games, they're losing, 
right? You play and play and play and die. You go back, you play and play and play and die. You go back, you play and play and die. Hours and hours and hours of dying. Um, but what they are doing is actually increasing their mastery, right? They get further. And this, this satisfaction around being able to do something competently is a thing that will keep people engaged for a very long time. If you've ever had kids uh, who spend a lot of time on computers playing games, four hours, well into the night, even after you turn the lights off and try to take their computer away, you know what I'm talking about. And then lastly, um, this idea that games give you a sense of autonomy, right? It's a free place for you to be. Uh, it's something that you can play with. It's something that people aren't going to bug you about. Uh, it's OK to just kind of be in the game space. And that is a thing that is an increasingly short supply. So meaning, mastery, autonomy. Uh, if you want an example, here's a pretty old one uh, from the city de Sciences in Paris. Um, they tried to do, well, they wanted to talk about epidemics, how do ac epidemics work? Uh, and so in this game, when you walk into the space, uh, you immediately get recognized by a computer vision system, and it projects a little um, health bar at your feet. And as you walk around the space, somebody is infected. And you don't know who they are, and they don't know who they are. Uh, but as you move through the space, eventually you see like more and more people are becoming infected. And you have a very uh, different appreciation for the way that infectious diseases spread than you would by just reading a bunch of panels or watching a really cool animation about that. OK. In closing, if data is land, as Peter Lucas argues, what is our responsibility as stewards of that digital land? How are we going to not just replicate the ills of the physical world in the digital realm and in the products that we make? And also, if we're going to think about what we do as being cyclical rather than sieges, uh, and by that I mean um, you know, everything is about getting to opening day. Do whatever it takes, work as long as it takes, spend as much as it takes, get to opening day. Um, that has led to like my own career, like most of the things I've ever worked on wound up in a dumpster. Uh, like every single show eventually winds up in a dumpster, which is maybe not the best way. Uh, and how are we going to change our relationships to our work in order to become more like gardeners than developers? One of the, one of the most important conversations I had um, early on in my career was with a, a French guy named Xavier Perrault, um, who was talking about the fact that working on the web is much more like gardening than like theater. Uh, and gardens exist in only two states, right? They are tended or they are abandoned. A garden is never done. Uh, and if you are a gardener, then your work is never done. So as you go back out there into your default lives, I'd like to end by asking you a fifth and final question. So grab your index cards. Can you guess what the question is? <laughs> Surprise. What are you going to bring home from this event? If there's time for questions, we'll take them. If not, Kiora, thank you very much. I tried, couldn't do it. Let's talk about five minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, did you a customary NDF umbrella? I wonder what it could be. <laughs> I've got good news. Um, we'll have some uh, questions again through Slido. Um, use the code oh. NDF2023. Um, thank you so much, Ed. <laughs> a huge uh, overview of everything that's going on. I want to cycle back to something that you said about um, being third on the block and the teenagers on the railway bridge um, all hang around to mm -hmm. jump off because uh, you said that paradigmatic change is uh, messy, painful, and a waste of resources. And something else that is those three things is uh, being a teenager, which is another yeah. key moment of change. So I wonder, what's the role of uh, peer pressure in uh, navigating uh, this change? My experience of 35 years plus working in museums is that museums are great copiers. Mm. Uh, like one of the nice things about working in this field is the extent to which we are free with our, our labor and our products and the fact that we copy each other incessantly all the time was a thing I always loved. Uh, whenever I worked on projects with uh, folks in the for-profit world and particularly with uh, large media brands, like the, the 
restrictions around like, well, yeah, no, you can't use that and you can't do that and anything you make, we're going to keep and you can't, like, oh, that's so irritating. Um, like, making as many things as we possibly can, knowing that people are going to copy them is one of the, I think, the superpowers that the sector has. Um, to give you an example, um, back in the days when people were arguing that open access was going to ruin museums, um, somebody asked Taco Dibbets at the, the Rijksmuseum, which had just launched this major open access initiative, uh, where they were making extremely high resolution digital images of all of their artworks available. And someone said, well, Taco, what if somebody puts a Vermeer on toilet paper? Uh, and his response was, well, you know, if somebody's going to put a Vermeer on toilet paper, uh, I want them to have the highest resolution of Vermeer <laughs> possible. I don't want them putting, like, crappy Vermeers on toilet paper. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that's part of the reason why we got to Immersive Van Gogh, was, right, all of those years of people doing open access work. Um, we didn't know at the time this was the particular form it might take, but it was clearly uh, something that was possible. Mm -hmm. And not worrying about control so much um, I think is a thing that we could probably do more of. Um, uh, another question that's coming is, do you have any examples of multiple organizations uh, collaborating, bringing together their digital experiences and services to do things that they might not have been able to achieve on their own? <laughs> Technically, the question's yes or no, but I'm sure people would love to know <laughs> what those examples are. Multiple times in my career, I have been part of efforts to try to get museums to work together and pool resources more effectively. Um, I can't say that any of them have been resounding successes. Probably the, um, the best example I know out there was, uh, for many years, there was an organization called the Science Museum Exhibit Collaborative. So this is not a digital example, because it's kind of pre-digital. Uh, but this was an organization of seven or eight different US and Canadian science museums who all uh, pooled resources to make exhibitions. So the, the idea was there were not enough good shows out there, and they wanted to figure out a way to uh, raise the, the sort of bottom level of what the pipeline was. And so when you joined the collaborative, you paid your, your yearly fees, and everybody would propose concepts for what they wanted to make and everybody in the collaborative would vote on it. And then you would go do some research on whether these concepts were gonna work or not, and then you'd go build these things. Um, so everybody had a say in making sure that anything that got produced was something that was gonna work for their specific audience as well as for the audience that it was being built for. And that kind of virtuous cycle of everybody thinking about a larger set uh, of audiences than just their traditional audience worked pretty well for at least 20 years. Uh, and then I, I think eventually fell victim to austerity like things do. As things do. Um, and our last question, and I will only ask this once, I promise. Uh, what are you going to take home from this event with you? <laughs> I can ask it five times if you like, but we're probably going to run out of time. I only wrote it down four times. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, so much, like Otto, I am, I am soaked in this conference. I have to go home. Um, the first thing I wrote down, uh, the thing that immediately sprang to mind, uh, is data is land. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a fair bit of work at the moment um, with the First Americans Museum in Oklahoma and, and trying to understand as an outsider uh, the realities of the Native American experience in the early 21st century. Um, so much of that has to deal with dispossession and land. Uh, so, like, land back is a huge issue in Native communities. Well, not really an issue. It's a, a thing they shout all the time, trying to get people to listen to them. Um, so this idea of uh, thinking about data as land for, for my digital practice is, like, very transformative. I haven't even really figured out what it means yet, but it means a lot. Uh, and it's going to make digital initiatives involving indigenous communities in the U.S., uh, I think, be able to understand and, and grapple with making assets available in the digital realm in a way easier than it would have been before having something as succinct as this to like, data's land, right? Like, yes, <laughs> oh yes, well we want, we want ours, and we want sovereignty over it, and we want to be able to say who can come and how and when, uh, and all of these things that right now are really hard conversations to have. Thank you very much. Um, something else that I hope you can take from this conference is uh, 
my pen now that you've put it in your shoe. Um, <laughs> Uh, everybody, uh, Mr. Ed Rodley. How about you?